Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar exploring the roles and responsibilities of maritime organisations in supporting seafarer welfare. I'm joined today by four fantastic panellists from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. Hopefully you will have had a chance to have a look at their bios, but I'll just do brief introductions um, for you. So first of all, we have Vulcan, uh, Vulcan Arslan, who is a senior human factors consultant at Lloyd's Register and a good colleague of mine. Um, he has an architect a naval architecture background and a PhD degree in safety culture from the University of Strathclyde. Recently, he has been developing um, the human factors aspect of the LR shield notation um, for onboard health management assurance. He also provides seafarer welfare awareness sessions for shipping companies and supports our clients in a technical capacity on various human related projects. Thank you Vulcan and welcome. Um, Olivia Swift um, is our senior program manager for Lloyd's Register Foundation. Um, an anthropologist by background, Olivia has previously spent 18 months living in a seafaring community in the Philippines and aboard ships. She has also been a lecturer at Goldsmiths University of London and a senior research fellow at Greenwich Maritime Institute. She has more than a decade's experience of consulting for maritime charities on topics relating to seafarer welfare, many pertaining to mental health. So welcome, Olivia, and thank you for joining us. Um, we have Heike Degim, uh, the director for the Maritime Safety Division of the International Maritime Organization. Heike joined the IMO in 1993 after completing a master's degree in marine engineering from Rostock University. In her current position, she is also acting as the secretary of the Maritime Safety Committee, IMO's senior technical body for ship safety and security related matters. Prior to her career at IMO, Heike worked as an R&D engineer in the German naval shipbuilding um, industry followed by several years as a senior researcher at the shipbuilding faculty of Rostock University, resulting a PhD in fishing technology and later in various positions in the German Maritime Administration. Welcome, Heike. And finally, we have Neil Dulling, um, who is the SF, uh, HSSEQ manager from MOL Group, specifically the LNG Transport Europe side, where he has been since 2013. Um, a seafarer by training um, who spent his seagoing time with the Royal Fleet Auxiliary until the year 2000. He has shoreside experience working for third party ship managers, managing short sea and deep sea vessels. And his initial years at MOL Group um, were within safety and security management in the European Tanker Division. Welcome, Neil. So each of our panelists are very eager to take questions today from our audience. So please submit these through Slido, which you should have a link to. And by using the code hashtag roles, that's hashtag all uppercase R-O-L-E-S. Please start your question with the panelist you'd like to address your question to if possible. And don't forget to vote for the questions of particular interest to yourselves so that we can prioritize in answering them after our panel debate. We are hoping to be able to um, get through as many of your questions as possible today, but any that we do have left over, the panel have kindly agreed to answer them offline and we'll be able to send out some responses following the webinar. So welcome all, thanks for joining me. I'd like to open our discussion um, by asking where does maritime organizations responsibilities for welfare start and end? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, maybe I can say a couple of things then. And first of all, uh, where the responsibility starts? And as we all know, the MLC and, and Maritime Labor Convention states that employers should provide an, a healthy and safe work environment. And ILO says that and all the factors adversely affecting well-being uh, should be taken into account and, and all these risks should be minimized. And of course, these are the bare minimum standards. And traditionally in the maritime, we have been focusing more on the physical health uh, in terms of the welfare. And the majority of the companies have been looking into hy hygiene factors, the so-called hygiene factors, such as the working environment, the temperature, the food quality. And but recently we have been moving towards the mental health side as well. 
I think these old requirements were setting the baseline and but where does it end I would say it is a continuous journey because the challenges the the requirements they continuously change so we need to we need to also continuously look into what kind of like resources we have what kind of uh, dealing and coping mechanism we have and how we best support and physical and mental well-being for seafarers thank you Vulcan um, Neil? Yeah, I, I think there's a role here for uh, the wider organizations within the maritime uh, sphere as well. I think those who are, are flag states and the IMO for setting um, standards and maintaining standards, um, we set uh, minimum standards for everybody going on board a ship that they must have a first aid course. We don't set a minimum standard that they must have been trained in mental health um, and recognizing mental health issues at all. Um, and our advanced medical care and our medical officers on board are required to be trained in uh, physical medical conditions, but not mental health medical conditions. So um, uh, to, to set that playing field, to make sure that everybody uh, is going to that standard, this needs to come from, uh, from the maritime industry as a whole through our flag states and set that as a common standard for everybody. Uh, I think it's long past time that we uh, treat mental health any differently to physical health. Thank you, Neil. Um, Heike? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to stress the connection between safety and security of shipping and the well-being of seafarers. The IMO is a technical organization. We doing the technical requirements for ships like uh, design, construction, navigation, uh, whatever we have there. However, it is a well-known fact that most mari maritime casualties are, if not due to human error or the human factor, the human factor is definitely a big contributor to many, many of the accidents that are happening today. So there's a direct connection that if the seafarers' well-being is ensured and they are happy and healthy, then the ship is safe. If this cannot be ensured, then the danger of anything happening uh, is increased many, many fold. And that shows, uh, especially now in these times of the pandemic with the crew change crisis, where many people have been on board seafarers for uh, extremely long time beyond their contracts, as stipulated in the MLC that was already mentioned, and becoming more and more unwell in a sense, and that endangers the safety of shipping directly. Thank you. Thank you, Heike and Olivia, from your perspective. Yes, I, if I can just step back a bit. Um, I mean, I think for any worker, welfare comprises a number of different things, and it's always provided by a, a composite of the employer, the state, charities, private provision, and so forth. But that arrangement is different for different um, nationalities, different sectors. And of course, what's specific about seafarers is that when they go to sea, they leave their home for a long period of time and work, and, and they, they're unable to leave work at the end of the day. So regardless of uh, legislative requirements on shipping companies, I think on a, on a moral basis, they have a requirement to go above and beyond standard occupational safety and health workplace welfare. Um, so it, degree, it involves, in other words, a degree of responsibility for what seafarers' lives at home and their families and communities as well. Um, but that said, you know, it does vary between states. So in the Philippines, for example, um, the union, the main union there provides a lot of welfare in terms of health care, education, housing and so forth. Um, but the state is relatively weak in that sense. So I think the first thing shipping companies need to do um, as well as ensuring they're um, uh, acting in accordance with the, the legislative framework is to take stock of that network. So if they're employing Filipinos, where are those crew able to access those services and where are the gaps? And if there are gaps, then it's incumbent upon them to try and fill them. Thank you. So I think there's some really interesting points there to open up our discussion. And um, it's so important to think about the different roles that different organizations play and the impact that they have. Um, Neil, from your side, what would you say are the priority areas of focus to provide comprehensive welfare support to seafarers from an organizational type perspective? 
I think uh, I think we've started to touch on 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 it already. Um, there are a couple of areas that really um, uh, spring out for me. Um, we already mentioned uh, wider family support um, and um, what we can do with that. We all have networks ashore, um, but I think the modern communications that we now have uh, that were never there historically within shipping. Um, make a big difference. Um, I think uh, historically we were not able to connect with our families when we were on board the ship. Um, uh, and when I went to sea, for example, um, the only way I found out what was going on at home was when the mailbag arrived and I got a, a letter from home. Um, however, now you you can be on board Facebook and, uh, and, and WhatsApp and be told about everything that's going on at home, but really can't do that much about it. Uh, and that's produced some real challenges from a from a mental health perspective for seafarers um so the idea of making sure as an organization that you do have the capability to support your seafarers families uh so that when something does happen the seafarer can tell us about it and we can activate a support mechanism that will help them and make sure that they are protected and and helped and what type of actions um, of support is MOL providing to the families? Have you got any examples for us? Oh, certainly. We have, uh, we have uh, our manning agents are all uh, situated in the countries that our, our seafarers come from. Um, and we have uh, all sorts of programs that we undertake. Uh, we have uh, trained welfare officers in each of our manning agents who can go and support families in times of need. Uh, we have the ability to uh, activate that at, sh at short notice and get people to them very, very quickly to support them. Um, we obviously have the resources of, of the MOL group, which helps us to be able to, to get things done when we need to get things done. On top of that, we quite often, uh, as part of our process with our seafarers, uh, have seminars and family days and trips out where we're encouraging people to be together and part of the family group. So uh it's it's well on well well understood within the group that we need to make sure our seafarers are, are looked after and, and well maintained and want to come back and work with them well okay thank you that gives an idea of the different things that could be put in place maybe more widely as well um olivia i know that lr foundation have done a bit of research into the priority areas um are you able to share any information on that for us today I think you're on mute. Mute indeed. <laughs> There's always one. Um, yes, I mean, actually, we've done research on related areas. We've commissioned research, I should say, on related areas. And we also see ourselves as having a role in pulling together the findings of, of other research as well. Um, so it's whilst it's not my role, it's much more Lloyd's Register's role to advise companies in this area. My observations from having followed the research that's there and, and more generally are that you've got a pretty good understanding of what seafarers feel that they need and want. Um, and that's accessible from particularly the work that's being put out by the Seafarers International Research Centre at Cardiff. Um, there was a big study by Yale recently as well, happiness index, so on and so forth. Um, perhaps what we're a little bit less sure on and this isn't just a plug for some roundtables that we have coming up, but, but, um, but, but we're less sure on how companies view um, the uh, risk factors in terms of what's, what's actually possible to change and, and what's, what they see to be worth changing. So it would be, it'll be helpful soon to be able to get that information and compare it to be able to try and move that forward a bit. Um, but more, more generally in sort of lay terms, I think, you know, actually that Maslow's triangle of needs is not a bad place to start. And even things like accessibility to water can be an issue in some cases. So I think from a company's perspective, again, as I said, you know, this isn't my role, but it's about making sure the basics are in place for sure, but also engaging with, with your crew as to what they um, find works for them, because it's, it's, um, that's such an important thing that, you know, I think there's a lot of guidance out there, which is very useful. In fact, possibly too much, and sometimes the challenge is to navigate the guidance, like practical um, shipping, uh, the like that the Nautilus put out. There's a great one from Iswan. Um, so use those, but also ask ask your crew specifically. 
And then um, I think one other issue might be to review internally whether the staff who are, who are responsible for delivering against their different, those different welfare priorities are um, empowered to do so. Is, is there one welfare officer who's able to influence all the different areas that need to be changed? Some of them are very um, broad and some are very specific, such as you know, water provision, as I said. So is there a way that you can join up that um, problem solving internally more effectively? Is that a stumbling block? That's very interesting indeed. And I think what we are seeing is that there's a lot of different priority areas and plans in place in different companies and organizations, um, which are kind of trying to do the right thing, but maybe need a little bit more guidance on, on how to get there. Um, and what the baseline is, I think a lot of people think they've got their baseline, but actually by speaking to some of the seafarers are finding that they perhaps have a surprise that some of those aspects that should be the baseline are maybe not fully actualized. Um, Vulcan, from your perspective, what would you say are the priority areas from the work that you're doing? Well, when we look into all priority areas, I think the first thing just we identified through uh, many ways through our surveys is the stigma around mental health, which acts as a massive barrier, which stops people and, you know, just to seeking for help when it's much needed. And it's that's why we need to work on just uh, on the specific area and remove the stigma around mental health. That's the, that's the that's massive barrier there. And probably other priority areas we need to work on is, is the, again, it has been discussed today, the value and recognition. We need to make sure that we just, yes, we say, uh, we're going to do many things. The Neptun Declaration probably will be talking about it today, and but we don't see much action on it. And and also probably other like a priority are just providing and um, as we identify and basic and mental health provisions such as um, mental health first aid training, so people can easily spot and uh, signs and help each other if needed. Probably I will summarize like that. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. And I think kind of going on for your point about stigma, um, how would we encourage our seafarers to raise welfare concerns that they may have? Neil, have you got any particular examples of initiatives that MOL are following at the moment? Yeah, um, I actually uh, have led this within the MOLNG team in Europe uh, over the last few years. Um, and we've taken our time about this and looked at what we felt we needed to do and how we could make sure we were able to ensure that if a concern was raised, it was dealt with in, a, in a, an appropriate manner. So uh, we took the time to send uh, initially, we'd planned to send our, uh, just our operational staff on training courses for supporting uh, mental health. Uh, and in the end, we decided to extend that to the whole company in London. Um, once we've completed that program, uh, the next stage was to work with industry partners to uh, move that onto the fleet. Um, and we launched that program at our uh, crew seminars. Uh, with me standing up there and talking uh, about uh, the whole idea of mental health um, and how to remove barriers from it. Um, there is a, a fantastic video which the WHO produced um, and you can search for it online. All you need to do is search for WHO Black Dog um, and it's a fantastic video. It's up on YouTube that can be used anywhere um, and that we used as a focus to get people to recognize that uh, anyone can be suffering from mental health issues at any time. Um, and it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to, uh, to try and hide away. Uh, you don't hide away when you have a physical injury. Uh, so why would you hide away when you have a mental health issue as well? It's something that you need to just be there to stand up and talk about and to remove that stigma and to say, this is perfectly normal. Uh, this is going to happen to everybody in their life, either they will personally suffer a mental health issue or they will know somebody who has suffered a mental health issue through their life. Every single one of us is exposed to it at some point in our, in our life. So um, the idea that we should hide it is 
uh, something that we no longer see is 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 normal or acceptable. We need to step away from that. Um, as I talked about before, I'd really love to see um, uh, mental health first aid training or something similar as a standard. Um, and uh, I'm an HSE manager. I'm not an SHE manager. I start with health. Uh, I don't start with safety. Health leads, and then you get safety from health. So um, it really is something that we just want to push. Um, uh, and that program of ours is, has been running now for uh, just under a year. It slowed down a little bit because it's been very difficult to get people to training courses uh, during the COVID lockdown. So uh, we've had to adapt it as we went along. Um, and it remains to be seen whether uh, the online courses that we've done are as effective as the physical courses that people went to. Uh, I, I don't know yet whether that will be the case or not. Yeah, until you've done a bit of evaluation and it's a little bit more mature and down the line, I suppose. It's, um... I can only say that certainly from the uh, from the physical sessions that we did, um, uh, a number of people came and talked to me after the sessions and talked uh, about issues that they'd suffered and talked about things that they wanted to tell me about after me standing up there and, 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 and taking a lead on it. So I do know that if you talk about it, you can deal with it, you can help people. Um, and I do know that at times it may literally only be someone saying, it's okay, and that's enough for them. It's all right to feel like that, and we can help you, is enough to get someone past that, that moment that matters, uh, just so they know they're not wrong, they're not something that is bad or uh, incorrect about having these feelings and thoughts. Do you find as well, Neil, that apart from the sort of mental health um, challenge side that seafarers tend to raise the broader welfare issues? So if they're finding that um, there's lack of food options or um, they've got requests about particular exercise equipment and things like that, do you tend to get much feedback from that side? We've tended to move. Uh, we have a, a very good. Sorry, let me let me start that again. We have a we we've encouraged a culture of open learning and and feedback from our seafarers. So we do get a good uh, feedback from it. But we've also encouraged um, our seafarers to take the initiative for themselves. So we provide a welfare fund to our vessels that the vessel can spend how it sees fit. Um, we support them with uh, purchasing uh, and use. Uh, the group's purchasing strengths to help uh, get the best deals for people. But if they feel they need something for their vessel at that time, they have a, a fund on board the ship that they can go out and get it when they see when they see that they need it. So we've empowered them to be able to do that for themselves as well. So there's a bit more autonomy on a on a local level to an yeah. extent. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, what have been the most effective practices, policies and initiatives implemented to improve seafare welfare whilst on board and off contract ashore? I think we've partially covered this. Um, Neil, have you got any more to, to add on that side, particularly possibly for the off contract uh, seafarers? I think um, it's been quite challenging for us all for the first time in living memory, certainly the first time in my career at sea, um, we've had shore, uh, we've had seafarers on shore for a prolonged period of time. Um, and I, I go back to what I said at the beginning of, of the session, it's about communications. Um, it's simply about making sure that you are in communication, that your, your manning agents or the company is in communication with your people while they're on shore to let them know that actually they are still part of the company and, and we do value them still and we will get them uh, onto a ship as soon as we can. Uh, those things are very important for people who are outside of what they're used to. Uh, and just keeping that basic level of communication going, I think, is very, very important. Um, and as I've talked about, we do family days, we do crewing seminars, um, and we encourage when we do our crewing seminars that, that our crew bring their family along with them. Uh, we want them to see that we uh, believe that they should have a good family life um, and that they're, they're, they're supplying and supporting their family and that we're supporting their family while they're at sea. Um, going away on ships is very different to... Uh, jumping on the train first thing in the morning and going into the office and coming home at that uh, after a day's work in the evening. Um, going on a ship and, and disappearing off for a month at a time is nowhere near the same thing. So 
they we do want them to feel they're supported. Thank you. And Heike, from a policy um, perspective, uh, what would you say has been the most effective initiative? Yes, on a, on a more general and maybe even global level, um, the IMO every year sets a maritime theme for the year. And the theme for 2021 is seafarers at the core of shipping's future. And uh, together with this theme, we have a lot of uh, campaigns and initiatives going on in IMO that is, of course, mainly a uh, publication of, of issues, uh, webinars, uh, questionnaires, polls among seafarers. We have tried over the last few years to uh, increase our outreach, which is normally the shipping industry, directly to the seafarers. So there is a special section on our website, for instance, where seafarers can contact the organization directly uh, and they, they will get an answer. And we have uh, campaigns where we put out questionnaires, mainly asking about seafarers' welfare. The results of these uh, questionnaires will be fed back then into the work of the organization. So that, that is, is to increase uh, our, our direct influence because as the global regulator, we are a bit removed from, from the coal phase. We, we don't do the, the work directly with the seafarer as Neil does, for instance, and we've been trying to uh, increase our effect in this regard. Thank you. Excellent. And, and just actually expanding a little bit on that, Heike, have you seen quite good response from that so far? Yes, we, we have seen a, a quite good response. Uh, it seems to be um, more concentrated in countries that are big labor suppliers. We have a lot of contact with uh, Filipino, Indian seafarers. They are also much more willing uh, to um, communicate over uh, over the computer, for instance, by email, and, and they are constantly in touch. We have, of course, also as a follow, as a consequence of the pandemic now, increased our, our direct work with individual cases of uh, seafarers that find themselves in hardship, either on board ships or on land, not able to join ships. So we have since March last year intervened in about 500 individual cases that reaches from getting people home from any point in the world up to getting them medical care, dental treatment, even uh, repatriating uh, dead bodies. Unfortunately, we had quite a few of those cases where seafarers that had died on board had to be carried around by the rest of the crew for several months before they were able to repatriate them to their home country. So um, the, the pandemic has definitely shown that, that a lot of work remains to be done in this regard. Thank you. Um, how can we use our knowledge of national culture uh, and embrace diversity to promote more effective welfare initiatives and wider, more appropriate support? Um, I'll direct this firstly, I think, to Neil. I think, um, again, I think I come back to um, what I spoke about before. We all have, as shipping companies, our representatives in the national countries where we're getting our seafarers from. We have our manning agents. Um, generally speaking, uh, you usually employ uh, nationals in those offices, so you have a direct access to the seafaring culture and, uh, and, and understand how that culture is. Um, I think there's a wider question as to whether um, whether we want to have a national culture or whether we want to have a company culture. Um, and I think uh, we do a lot of work in making sure that we, we embed a company's culture uh, with our sea staff. Um, but the best way to get that culture is to use your, uh, the, your national offices and your local offices to understand how your seafarers learn best and then teach them in the way that they learn best. Um, so I think the role of our manning agencies is absolutely critical here in making sure that we get teaching and training done in the way that uh, our seafarers learn the best. Thank you. And Vulcan, from your perspective,
sorry, I've been trying to unmute myself. I think, yeah, as Neil said, it's it's very important and uh, just to to understand these uh, different na national like uh, we have like uh, it's the one of the most multicultural uh, workforce. The shipping, the shipping, like all the seafarers, and so I think it's important to understand how they learn best, as yeah, as he said, also how they perceive different things and how how they challenge, uh, or how they uh, if they need for help, for example, in terms of mental health, and how they find it easier to do they find it talking to someone on their own level. So in terms of the uh, national culture and how because it is the one of the main pillars of the organizational culture we need to understand and acknowledge and people uh, would be perceiving things uh, and then that's why I learn things differently they will seek for help dif differently so rather than just like having one fit all solution similar to for example when we provide food on board you know we just provide an and what Filipino crew like, what Ukrainians like, similar to for welfare support. If we also train, uh, provide, for example, mental health first aid training to certain people because they they perceive power distances in a simple terms, perception of hierarchy differently. So it is very important we understand how different um, nations they think, so how we can best help them just when they need to seek for help. Thank you. And in terms of looking at crewing and nationality mixes, um, what types of experience have we had as a as a team at LR Advisory based on on that? Well, uh, as you know, as I as I say, the shipping is the most um, um, probably the, the most uh, diverse and um, occupation. And when you go on board, you just always see, and you know, people have because of their own also values and norms and of course we want yes organizational culture and as neil says want to be all right with some of the national beliefs so we have a common belief system but this is we need to because we just trying to embrace diversity and people have we also have a lot to learn from each other so we need to manage these differences very carefully onboard ships that just uh, they, everyone can uh, work in a harmony and most importantly we can benefit from our uh, diverse background and can help each other as well. Thank you. Um, what more can ship owners and managers do to ensure their seafarers feel valued and recognized as key workers? Um, I think we've touched on some of this but um... Maybe this time I'll go to Olivia. Sure, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think there are perhaps two separate issues there. I mean, the key workers is is absolutely, um, you know, has been such a big issue during this crisis, and it's uh, it is about effectively it's about governments making that change. But of course, having the public opinion behind um, that effort makes a big difference as well. Um, but then feeling valued, I think, is a lot deeper rooted and it relates to retention, really. So I think companies that pay attention to how they retain and nurture their crew will automatically have crew that feel that bit more valued, at least most of the time. So um, I think there's that. Um, and then I think it sort of applies to different spaces, too. So on board, it's about having the right leadership in particular, so particularly masters. And of course, zero tolerance of bullying and harassment. Um, it's also about that sort of ship shore communication and make, and, and um, that also can have an effect on how seafarers feel in terms of being appreciated. Um, but of course, stepping back again, I think you know anyone's sense of value doesn't just come from their workplace and their employer. It's uh, it's a lot more really to do with their home life, and so. Um, you really cru crucially need to think about how you support home life. And a big part of that could be around, say, shortening contracts, as well as the support for families and so forth. Because if a seafarer really is disconnected from its family, lost touch with children, and so on and so forth, their sense of value isn't going to be a, for a sort of regular standard for which, you know, companies can then um, build upon. Neil, from your perspective? 
Yeah, I think it's been very difficult for um, seafarers to to uh, be taken as key workers. I, I, there's a lot of countries out there who said, yes, seafarers are key workers, but that hasn't translated into uh, supporting them to get to and from their jobs. It, uh, we, we've seen even in the UK where they made great story of, uh, of supporting seafarers. Uh, we've seen recent media headlines with uh, crews now having to spend 14 weeks in quarantine before they're allowed to go and join a ship when they come to the UK because uh, it's not fair and seafarers are getting away with breaking the rules, which was never the case, but that's how it's been perceived. Um, and even the UK government hasn't stepped up and um, countered that at all. No comment from them whatsoever saying, no, that's not right. These are key workers and they had to they had to isolate before they left. They were tested before they left their country. They were in isolation uh, throughout their entire traveling period and, and en route to the ship. There is no risk of seafarers uh, transmitting the virus to the rest of this country and we should be supporting them, making sure that they can do that. Um, uh, I also think people don't understand the role that seafarers play in, in wider society at all. I think in general, uh, shipping is not really understood uh, by uh, countries and by uh, the people in general. Um, the number of conversations I had after uh, the Suez Canal got shut down recently for people saying, how is this possible? How could that happen? Um, and, and why did that happen? It was not anything to do with the positives that there are thousands of ships out there um, carrying on regardless and, and one ship has a problem and therefore the world ends. It was all seen as a negative uh, throughout and yet for the entire pandemic lockdown shipping has been carrying on and doing what we do um, and supplying everybody and keeping everybody fed and watered and keeping the lights on uh, throughout the process. So a lot more needs to be done at a, at a national level and an international level in recognizing seafarers. I often use the, the phrase that uh, countries are sea blind. They don't see anything beyond the borders. They don't see anything once they've left the coastline. They don't recognize what's going on around it. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot more to be done there um, at a national uh, level. I think in making seafarers uh, feel valued, um, I think there is, is where a company culture comes in. I think there, if you have a good company culture that recognizes your own workforce, um, that recognizes it as an open culture and a valued culture and that everybody has value and that everybody has um, a place within that organization and can affect that organization, um, that's how you make sure that your seafarers uh, will stay with you and will, and, and will feel value of being part of your company. Yeah, I think there's a there's a lot that can be done um, more broadly. And I know since I started my role within Lloyd's Register three years ago, there's so many things that that you then sort of talk about, like the crew change crisis or or other aspects that um, friends and family of mine have no idea about because it's not really communicated in the media the same way as as we do. So it it's almost like a a bit need to know basis uh, for some of the things that are going on. So um, yeah, I completely agree. I also think there's been a lot of um, saying yes, seafarers are key workers and, and, and um, uh, I'll bring in my own organization here. I had a crew change that took place this week and of the eight crew members who joined my vessel, only one of them had received his vaccination in his home country. Uh, and when asked why, because we're not allowed to get it, it's not a priority for seafarers. So they can talk about making and saying that key, uh, that the seafarers are key workers, but if they're not following that through, um, the seafarers don't believe it. Yeah, I think that's quite a powerful, powerful statement at the moment as well. And there's, um, you know, the the queries around whose responsibilities is it in terms of the vaccinations. And I think that's very much an ongoing sort of debate really. Um, I mean, I think companies like mine can step up and we are stepping up um, and we have pushed and, and each country that we go to, I've, I'm having my ships uh, ask the local authorities 
uh, if uh, if I can get my crew shore leave, um, because that's been banned pretty much for the last year. Uh, even if it's just within the terminal or within the portal area where they can go and walk on a bit of grass uh, somewhere where they're safe and protected and not exposed to whatever's going on locally. Um, and, and equally, um, wherever possible, um, we've set up uh, with a number of uh, ship management companies, we've looked at uh, getting our seafarers vaccinated on board the ships. Uh, uh, at the moment, there's a very limited opportunities for doing that. Um, and uh, as far as we're aware at the moment, only the United States will vaccinate uh, seafarers of any nationality in their ports. Um, Obviously, we have to be careful with making sure that we don't interrupt the operation of the vessel while we're doing that, but we're doing everything that we can to make that happen for every one of our vessels that, that goes to a US port. And I'd really like to encourage other countries to, to step up and do the same. And that leads on uh, to the next question, really, um, which I'll direct at this point to Heike. Uh, what more can be done beyond the Neptune Declaration to ensure improved seafarer welfare? The Neptune Declaration has a few uh, very valid and very good points in it. Uh, recognize seafarers as key workers, as Neil just alluded to, and give them a prioritization for vaccines. IMO has uh, encouraged our member states to recognize seafarers as key workers. We have 174 members and only 60 have notified us that they have actually done this recognition. So although we're constantly on them, the figure is not uh, unfortunately increasing to the degree we would like to see. The industry has developed a recommended framework of protocols for ensuring safe ship crew changes that we have issued uh, so that it can be used globally. We have also drawn attention, and Neil also alluded to that already, that uh, charterers that have started to insert no crew change clauses in, in charter contracts, uh, charter parties, we have tried to address that by issuing uh, relevant guidance. Uh, I have to confirm what Neil said about the sea blindness of so many people, taking into account that more than 80% of all goods in the world are transported by ships. It is astonishing how little people know about this. They somehow assume that the goods magically materialize in supermarkets. I, I do not know what they think where this is all coming from. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we have now also managed, we are a UN specialized agency dealing exclusively with shipping, but we have now managed to raise the matter of the crew change crisis to the attention of the UN General Assembly. And in December last year, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution uh, addressing this and, and uh, encouraging countries to deal with the matter. And we as the IMO have been asked to report back to the next General Assembly, which will take place in September. So this gives the whole issue a, a much, uh, much more publicity worldwide and hopefully will lead to more people becoming aware of the, the issue or the problem seafarers face uh, internationally. It is not an easy profession in, in uh, normal times, but now lots of the problems have increased so much. So it's an ongoing sort of we've got a starting point, we're trying to kind of rally the people and, and get some motion going. And it depends, um, of course, how long this, this situation will be ongoing. But even afterwards, we can already foresee that uh, we will need to put, um, put a framework in place to avoid this kind of thing happening again. I mean, you cannot avoid a pandemic happening again, but the consequences for shipping Surely the many problems we have seen, there are lessons to be learned and things can be addressed in a better way. Thank you. And you, I think we've alluded to sort of the unique situation that the seafarers is in, in, in their working lives and environments. Um, Olivia, how do you think that we can give a realistic expectation to potential seafarers of the environment they'll be working in? Hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I think it, it, realistic is the key word there. Um, 
but it's also not stable. So there are, well, it, there is probably now outdated research, thinking, thinking particularly about the Filipino crew, um, about what motivates desire to go to sea. And I'm sure there's similar um, evidence out there for other nationalities too. And it always used to be um, to provide for family, um, to see the world and, you know, a few other things. Now the see the world thing has kind of gone out the window before COVID. I mean, sure leave became less and less of a, uh, an option. Um, providing for family still is a massive driver and that that hasn't changed unless you've been unfortunate and had uh, delays with with, um, with wages um, you know I think there are many occupations that are challenging but it doesn't make them necessarily undesirable per se so we do need to so being I mean we could learn a lot I think from the military from um, certain other sectors in engineering for example where there's a, there's a very strong sense of professionalism as there is in seafaring and, um, and in, in the Philippines, that's something that's been quite actively developed over recent decades to great effect. Um, I speak about the Philippines because that's where I have most experience personally, but you know, lessons apply more generally. So I think it, it, it runs from um, everything from the kind of public awareness. And I think we do have to be careful at this moment in time that while seafarers do need backing and need to be valued, that they're not, the trade as um, simply as victims because they are also professionals and you know um, so I think it has to be in, in that public narrative but also in training you know a realistic expectation I'm not necessarily saying we need psychometric testing because that's somewhat debatable as to the value of that as to you know but but there is truth in that seafaring isn't for everyone um, and of course there is quite a range of roles within seafaring so I think maybe in a more open discussion about options um, it would certainly help get more women involved um, and then there are things that industry can do to make it more attractive um, for, for, for the younger generation and, and for a more diverse um, crew pool and you know that again is to do with shortened contracts access to internet and so on and so forth so yeah it's um realistic and and open but also more nuanced I think would be my summary. Excellent okay I'm just aware of the time and um, we've got a few questions coming in from the audience um, so if I have a look at the top one we've got one here uh, for Heike um, do you think IMO can be a driving force to ensure that mental health training and support are embedded in organization safety management systems? That, that is definitely a possibility. Uh, traditionally, these issues have been dealt with more by ILO, the International Labour Office, and of course, the Maritime Labour Conventions, dealing with working and living conditions on board ships. However, there is undeniably a connection also to the ISM code, the International Ship Management Code, which is about the, the general management of a ship. And uh, we could definitely in, include there relevant provisions. I mean, that's actually, it's a great idea. I have not <laughs> really thought about this before, but it would definitely be the right place. Not, of course, not to include detailed provisions on this, but include requirements to make sure that the, the mental health of seafarers is addressed and, and taken care of. Thanks. This is what we rely on our audience for, new ideas quite <laughs> often. So thank you to Anonymous uh, for that one. I think, um, I think on that one as well, uh, Stephanie, the right place for uh, mental health training for seafarers, it, it, you have to do this designed around the seafarers themselves. Um, the off-the-shelf courses that you get uh, on shore are not necessarily going to be correct. We've already talked about the fact that it's it's a different breed of people. It's a different type of person that goes to sea, um, and we have to make sure that the that the right person is in the right role at the right time. Um, uh, so I think actually the the right uh, the right place for us to start looking at would be the STCW ninety five. Uh, training requirements for seafarers actually include a mental health training in the same way that we've done first aid in the same way that we've done uh, engineering and uh, marine competencies make it a competency requirement uh, and there you have the way of doing it 
Stephanie, if I may come in here again, uh, just sure. following on from what Neil said, um, we just going about a complete revamp of the SDCW convention. That has I mean just that. been proposed. <laughs> to, it is a bit out of date. It's from 1978, the original. Yeah. So it, it's time to, to have a, a comprehensive look at it again. This will start probably next year, and it will take into account any any lessons learned, not only uh, not from from developments globally, like uh, much more attention to to uh, mental health issues, but this. And this can definitely be included, but if it will take a while. I mean, it's not something that will be done in one or two years. This takes a longer time. Thank you. So the first step is to actually be reviewing it and looking at it and updating it. So I think that's a positive. Thank you for that information. Um, what are international organizations doing towards vaccinating seafarers? Many nations do not have vaccines. So what information do we have in the panel about that at the moment? Um, Neil, what's your experience of the different nations um, approach to this? Uh, from a nationality perspective, I, I uh, have seen uh, an amazing response in some countries. I've seen a really poor response in other countries. Um, uh, the Philippines, for example, uh, contacted all the shipping companies that were in, in their territory recently and asked them to provide a forecast of seafarers, how many seafarers were going to be needing to leave to join ships in the next few months, month by month by month, so that they could uh, prioritise and ensure that they got vaccines in time for those seafarers who were going. Uh, we've seen lots of things in social media for uh, in in India where the where the uh, Indian co where, where companies have been able to do uh, vaccine drives not only for the seafarers but the seafarers families as well and I think that's one of the important things uh, that needs to be followed up. It's all well and good if the seafarer is vaccinated and is is is. Uh, protected from COVID, but if their family gets sick back at home because they haven't had the vaccine, that's a massive amount of stress and uh, worry for the seafarer on board the ship. Um, I have had cases on my fleet of uh, seafarers' families who've become ill and the level of, uh, of distress that the seafarers feel when they know about it because they're in contact with their families but can't do anything about it is, is, is really high and, and, and not healthy. Um, so actually including seafarers' families in vaccination programs, not just the seafarers themselves, is, is absolutely uh, a vital thing. And we have seen um, uh, the US where they have, um, uh, where they have uh, used and, and allow uh, in their ports any international seafarers to be vaccinated. If, if you can get the organization done to get the people onto the ship, you can get seafarers vaccinated in their ports. So um, it, it is uh, happening in some places. It's sporadic. It's not systemic in any way, shape or form. Um, and, and there are a number of countries out there who have no plan at all in terms of vaccinating their own populations, let alone the seafaring subset of their populations. Um, so um, we've all been very lucky. We, we, we're living in the UK and, in, and, and um, they were extremely well organised in getting this done. But there are others out there who haven't been. Um, Heiko, you may or may not be able to answer this, but is is there at the moment a way to more broadly share best practice and sort of success stories or advice across the different international countries? Oh, we, we do that. We have issued, we issue a circular letter. This is the 4204 series of circular letters with lots of addenda, giving advice on, on all kinds of issues and aspects of the crew change crisis, including vaccination. We have also um, adopted uh, some resolutions in the Maritime Safety Committee encouraging, I mean, that's all we can do as an UN organization countries to prioritize seafarers. We are now developing another resolution to go to the IMO assembly, which will meet in December and has a wider outreach. So hopefully uh, this will have an effect. But we have also been in direct contact as a UN agency with the WHO, which leads the effort in the UN system on vaccination. We have especially been in negotiations with the COVAX facility 
in order to explore possibilities to, uh, to dedicate certain numbers of vaccines for seafarers. We have not been successful, I have to say there. The uh, international situation has gotten so much worse and the uh, vaccines allocated by COVAX to can there are still countries around the world that have not vaccinated anyone. And as long as that is the case, uh, seafarers will not be a priority. So, but it was an experience to educate people again about shipping in WHO, mainly medical uh, people working there. They had not the faintest idea what the situation is. So we needed to start with a very simple explanation why seafarers travel internationally and why they need to be given priority. So we are working on this. Yeah, it's interesting that really you think you need to educate the WHO <laughs> to then go on and support. But of course, yeah, um, we've helpfully been um, shared. There's been a link shared to a Bahamas Maritime uh, Welfare Survey, so that will be distributed as well. So thank you for uh, Anonymous for giving us that. Um, are there any initiatives through IMO Seafarer Crisis Action Team that we can share today? The, the initiatives of the, the, the Crisis Action Team, it's exactly what it says in, in the title, a Crisis Action Team. So as I said before, we mainly addressing now uh, individual cases of seafarers that have all kinds of problems due to the pandemic. We have also started to reach out to regional uh, UN organizations, especially the regional UN uh, resident coordinators in certain areas. We have a huge problem at the moment uh, in the Pacific with seafarers from Kiribati in, in particular that have not been able to go back to their country and there are quite substantial numbers uh, distributed all over the world waiting to go home. And yeah, th this, is, this is what we, we are doing at the moment. The, uh, the, the, the greater tasks of addressing uh, international guidelines, recommendations, instruments to address these problems, that will probably only be possible after the pandemic. Thank you. Um, there's a few comments rather than questions um, coming in. Um, and just so we're aware, we, we're coming to a close fairly shortly. So if you do have any questions for our panel, then you've got roughly about two to three minutes to, to get them in. Um, so uh, the comments for Neil, basically just pointing out that some nations don't have a standard framework for vaccination of seafarers, yeah. which I think we're all aware of. Um, and also in agreement um, that that's exactly the point that you've made to have all international efforts to get seafarers vaccinated. So I think we're all in agreement there that as much as possible needs to be done to make sure that, that there is vaccination occurring where it can or is needed. Um, and a thank you to Heike for your input has come in from the audience as well. Um, so oh, we have one question as well. Um, I think I'll pick that one up. Why, why, why the IMO don't have a database of active seafarers? Yes. Yeah, I think I'll pick that one up. To be honest with sure. you, because <laughs> um, because seafarers don't want them to have it. Yeah, it's a very simple answer. The 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 IMO is is an international organisation um, designed around standards, and seafarers don't particularly see them as something that is is there for individual seafarers. Um, and there are a number of nationalities who we have seafarers from who don't want anybody to have their private information. Um, so uh, trying, trying to get the whole industry to come together. And we have never been a united industry about anything, as far as I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> we, are, we, we do it through national flags. We work as, as national organizations and, and with flags of convenience that moves things very, very differently. So the idea of having one central database of anything in shipping, I think, is, is not something that the seafarers would want and not something that would, would really be practical. I, I agree. We have at the moment about 1.6 million seafarers and the numbers change and fluctuate constantly. I mean, that would be a major work to keep a database like that going. What we have, though, is uh, 
the possibility to check the certification of seafarers uh, via the IMO uh, website. However, this is again down to individual countries to uh, provide this information. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and it looks like, unfortunately, that's all the time we've got this uh, today. So thank you all for your attendance at this session. And thank you very much to all the panelists for giving up your time today. Um, more information about the Seafarer Mental Health and Wellbeing Special Interest Group uh, can be found on the IMRS website for anybody that's interested. And it's open to all IMRS members to join. Let's keep networking and talking um, about these really important topics and continue to raise awareness. I think from this morning's, uh, this afternoon's panel, we've seen how important it is to keep raising the awareness broadly um, and drive some positive change. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.